Hello, New York Giants fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Valentine's Views podcast here on Big Blue View Radio, part of your SB Nation family of podcasts. Please like, share, and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts across the Big Blue View Radio network. All right, the, the NFL playoffs are rolling along, but your New York Giants are deep into their offseason, which means that for, for Giants fans, it's it's really NFL draft season. And here to help me uh, with some thoughts on, on the Giants and the NFL draft it is none other than, than the man, the myth, the legend himself, Emery Hunt of, of Football Game Plan, CBS Sports. Been a while, Em. How you doing? Doing fine, Ed. Always a pleasure to come in and talk ball with you, man. Hey, so... Uh, so we were chatting a little bit off air before we started, but uh, you know, most of us, most of us are are just starting to wrap our heads around. We've got to study the NFL draft. We've got to get to know these players. We've got to start to learn this draft class. You know, beyond watching a few college football games in the fall, but you're knee knee deep in it, maybe neck deep in it. So how many? all-star games showcases and all of that have you already been to in the last month oh man i've been to four the fcs bowl which is in daytona beach on december 9th um college gridiron showcase which is in fort worth from january 5th through the 7th the hula bowl later on that week i was there the whole week because i was a sideline analyst on the game uh at the hula bowl then I just came back from the Tropical Bowl, which was the 18th and 19th. And then I'll be heading down to the Shrine Game and Senior Bowl uh, the rest of this month. And then middle of uh, late February, I'll go down to the HBCU Legacy Bowl. So there's three more all, All-Star all games left, and I've gone, gone to four already. You, you do realize, of course, that aside from the Shrine Bowl and the, and the Senior Bowl, a lot of people have never heard of the rest of those games. <laughs> right. And that's what and, – and I'm glad – you said that, Ed, because here's the thing. When I go to those games, it's great to see the amount of scouts from teams that are there. And we talked about this last training camp where when you're looking at that 90-man roster and you're like, oh, wow, I remember seeing the Giants heavily at the College Gridiron Showcase or at the Hula Bowl or at the, you know, the uh, Tropical Bowl. And, wow, look at these guys that – participated and at the then NFLPA game you're like wow look at these guys that were in those all-star games not surprising to see them on the 90 man roster because the Giants had a heavy presence there so it's it's for me it's two parts it's scouting but it's also info intel gathering on who's out there and and it kind of ties into what you will see come August in other words you know you look at a 90 man roster and you, and it's like oh it makes sense that this guy's on that 90 because we saw a lot of scouting rep, you know, representation from this team at whatever game he was he was in. Absolutely. It makes so much sense. And it, it helps you sharpen your blade as a scout uh, or a scouting analyst like myself, where you're looking at guys and you say, oh, oh, I can see why or how this player fits in with the Giants and what they want to do. And now you start to kind of put together a profile. As long as the front office stays intact, you can put together a profile on what certain teams value more so in prospects than others. I just know, am I just know that, that I wouldn't want to see your travel budget or your clothes <laughs> budget. <laughs> right. They both get out of whack at times, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. Uh, I, I know how much I just look at, I look at the combine in India and I'm like, it's going to cost me that much to go there. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> well, the good part about these trips is that they tend to pick two spots, either in Florida or Texas. So as you could you kind of get a, a good lay of the land of what it's going to cost to go to and from, and, and you know you we're around uh, those two spots. Now, if there was a different all-star games, different spots, like it, it'd be crazy. There you go. Hey, so let's uh let's let's get a little bit more serious here. Um something popped up this morning that that I wanted to ask you about Jim Nagy, who runs the uh, the Senior Bowl. Had Jim on my show a couple of weeks ago for an early look at the Senior Bowl, early, super early look at the draft. Jim tweeted something this morning that I wanted to ask you about. He tweeted that, you know, we know that the college football landscape is changing with the portal, with 
the NIL money, with all of the uh, the consolidation of conferences and, and all of that. But he tweeted this morning that the NIL money that's being handed out and all of that sort of blew up the Senior Bowl rosters. It cost them a lot of players that they thought they were going to get. And what he said by extension of that is – He thinks it's going to seriously impact the caliber of prospects on day three in this draft. He said he thinks that you're going to find teams trying to bail on a lot of these late late round draft picks, trying to trade them, trying to use them to move up and get guys. I'm just I'm curious for your thoughts on on how the NIL, you know, affects, you know, might affect the draft class and whether you think Jim is right. You know, Jim definitely has some some credence to say that because he's been in it. He's he's still in it, um, and he has a lot of good intel on why that is the case. Uh, I, I just look at it like this: you know, maybe it's not particularly the NIL, but that COVID year has killed everybody because just when you think a guy is done eligibility wise, boom, he has a COVID year to to, to go back, and the free transfer year. And an injury year. So we're seeing guys hang around Kyle for six, seven years, right? Five, six, seven years. Usually you had um, five to play four, right? That was a normal thing before COVID. Now there's some gray area. And I think 2025 is when we'll see the end of the COVID eligibility requirements. So therefore, we should get back to guys getting to regular eligibility. You know who's a senior? No, I can't tell you how many times last year. I went through my draft guide and had to take out scouting reports because I thought the guy was done eligibility wise. They come to find out he's going back to school. And you're like, wow, I thought it says senior on the website and you count the years. You're like, all right, well, he got his COVID year back and he played four. So he should be done. And it's like, nope, he has another year. He, he was hurt and they applied for an injury year. I'm like, wow. So mm-hmm. you have a bunch of that going on in addition to the NIL, in addition to guys just being able to transfer freely so they're going to get that extra year of opportunity. So I think it's all of those factors involved. But for day three, you got I, you know, I always tend to spend things positively. If you're a team and if you're a small college prospect, maybe this is the opportunity that you've been looking for because either they're going to trade up to go get somebody they want specifically or trade back to the 2025 draft to acquire more um, picks or – if you was a guy that was on the fringe of being a priority free agent, man, let's just draft him to secure his rights and not compete with someone else. So it, it could be a, a a boom for the small college prospect in this particular draft class. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and it kind of blends into some of the all-star games that you've already attended. The reality of it is some of these guys that you're really splitting hairs when you look at the talent level, when you look at the ability level, there's there's such little difference that that sometimes, I mean, can it just simply be, you know, the name on the helmet that gets a guy an opportunity where it's, you know, the the fact that the another guy with the equal ability doesn't have that name on the helmet and doesn't get the chance. All the time, Ed, man. And it's it's unfortunate that that's the case, but we are in a CYA business when you speak about scouting and evaluation which is why people think i'm i'm off base when i give my scouting takes and my prospect rankings like wow how could you have this guy this high when everyone else has this guy low well maybe everyone else is comfortable being in that group and try to subscribe to group things so if if the player misses they can say well we all missed on this guy right Mm -hmm. it's safe to say that Rather than, yo, I missed on that guy. But you got to have the confidence to go out there and be yourself, be your own person, and say, yeah, I missed on this guy. I hit on this guy. Or I just didn't see it with this guy. Whatever the case may be. So it's easier to say, we'll take this player from Ohio State because we know he played against top competition. We know he has the athletic profile that you need to play at Ohio State. So it's a safer pick than the kid from let's say a division two Finley college, which is in Ohio, right? We, even though he has dominated his competition, which is what you want to see, he has the requisite height, weight, arm length skill that you want to look for in a, in a prospect. 
and you're watching him in an all-star game hold his own against guys from the FB, uh, G5 and Power 5 levels of competition. So that that guy is showing you he's ready to go and play NFL ball. But if you miss on him, say, like, why would you take a chance on a guy from Division II school when you miss on this Ohio State kid? Well, you know, maybe it just didn't work out. You, know, you can find some reason to blame it, but you won't get the pushback if you missed on a kid that showed you everything just because he came from a Division II. Absolutely. And I've said this before, and I say this, you know, almost every time you and I talk draft on, on the show here. And it's one of the, the things that I give you the most credit for is that that you don't care if your scouting opinion, if your scouting report, you don't care if it's different than 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 the rest of the the scouting community. I mean, you've you've missed on guys. You know you've missed on guys, but you've also hit on some guys. I remember. I can remember you pounding the table again and again and again and saying that, you know, there's no way Lamar Jackson should have land should have lasted as long as he did in the draft. But but I always give you credit for standing on your own two feet and, and saying this is what I think, not not what the group thinks. You have to, Ed, because we subscribe to, you know, uh to to you know big blue view to get your thoughts. We don't want to know what you heard we want to know what you think because that's what makes you you so when people subscribe to football game plan or the the youtube channel or the draft guide they want to know what i think whether they agree or disagree at least they know this is what emory thinks and they can mm -hmm. just we'll just have to wait and see if he's right or if he's, if he's wrong or how far off he is or how far ahead he was i always and i, and I just recently tweeted this out because i had to just puff my chest out a little bit based off what we just saw this past draft. And I, and it's funny because if you're looking at the Lions and how much success the Lions are having, uh, you look at my draft guide the last three years since they've since Brad Holmes has been there, they've gotten my number one tailback, my number one slot corner, number one defensive tackle, number one nose tackle. They My top five across the board, offensive lineman with a number one center, number one tackle, number one slot receiver, They've done a number five linebacker twice. So they've killed the draft. So if I was a GM of a team, the Lions would be a team that would look like what I would have drafted based off my scouting reports. And people knock me constantly for, you know, Jameer Gibbs over B. John Robinson. You know, all these things that people knock you for, but you let it play out. And you're like, wow, that was pretty dead on. And so you got to be able to, to trust in what you're seeing. And if you're going to whiff, with on your own accord as opposed to trying to stay comfortable in that group and so you could say oh well we no one saw this coming or we all missed on this guy so so now we know you're secretly working for dan campbell or they buy the draft guy <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that could that could, don't make me laugh em. oh man i thought i was i thought i was rid of that cough but uh hey i did want to ask you since you went there you talked about the Lions, and I actually have in my notebook here, you know, I wanted to talk to you about the Lions and really what the Giants can learn from these four teams that are left in the in the in the playoffs, particularly when it comes to the draft. And I'm I'm particularly curious about the Lions because the Lions went their own way in the draft this past year. They drafted a running back at 12, they drafted I think Jack Campbell, the, line, the inside linebacker, was also a first-round pick. They drafted a tight end. They didn't follow the, well, you don't draft this position because it's not value. You don't draft that position early because it's not value. They just drafted players they thought fit what they wanted. So I'm really curious for your thoughts about, about what teams can learn from, from the Lions and, and the rest of the teams that are still playing. And they drafted my number one flex tight end and Sam Laporte. That's who you brought up. Yeah. That, that, so again, mm -hmm. the Lions definitely have purchased the draft guy. Chargers too. They got a lot of my number one players too. But I will say this, and, and you laid it out perfectly, Ed. When you think about when we're all watching these games, right? We all sat down as a nation and watched these games over the weekend. At what point during the Lions game did you say, man, that was a great one run by Gibbs, but 
they pro- I would have felt better about that had they taken him in the second round as opposed to the first round. You don't care. You just want the you just hope the guys that you have are good. Because when you're watching a game, and Giants fans can relate to this, no one cares that you know Trey Hawkins was taken in the sixth round. They just like that he's out there, he's playing well, he's good. They they want to see good football players. They don't care that Jalen Hyatt was a third round pick. He's good, you know. So that's the thing. I don't know when did we become so fixated on positional value. You don't take this position in the draft, high in the draft. Man, if you see a good player, take a good player, period. Because that's all it's about, acquiring talent. No matter how you acquire that talent, you want a a roster that's talented and injury-proof. And teams, the Final Four, have shown you the importance of drafting talent, the importance of having depth, and the importance of just playing your best players. And that's the biggest takeaway from anyone uh, anyone should have when looking at these final four teams or just looking at the playoffs. It's about getting the best guys on your roster. It's a talent acquisition business. The draft is a talent acquisition process. You have to get talent. If you feel like, hey, we need a game breaker at running back, and you see a game breaker in Jameer Gibbs, you take the game breaker. Don't try to say, well, we can... We don't need Jameer Gibbs because we can get Damian Pierce in round six. No, you take Jameer Gibbs. That's the key. Just take the talent that is there to be taken and put your best 53 out there on the roster, your best 11 on the field, your best 11 on defense, and go play ball. Do you understand the argument that, for example, with the Lions, the Lions took Jameer Gibbs at 12. The Giants a few years back took Saquon Barkley at number two. Do you understand the argument that the Lions were much closer to being a a finished product, so the running back early makes more sense than the Giants, for example, or any team starting a rebuild? You know, with a with a with drafting a a running back, a player like that, so early. Do you understand that argument, or does it not? Does does that not have any credence with you? That doesn't have any credence because think about the Giants when they were taking Saquon too. Right, they still had OBJ. <laughs> they still had talent on that roster. Evan Ingram, obviously, Evan Ingram wasn't the Evan Ingram that we saw in uh, in Jacksonville, but he was still pretty doggone good, a prospect. Um, they thought, you know, this team just needed someone that could take some of the pressure off Eli, so they took the game breaker. And rewind back to 2018, the Browns had the first and fourth pick in the draft, and I was on record saying all draft cycle, if I'm the Browns. I am taking Saquon one because I know the Giants want to Saquon and I'm taking Lamar Jackson at four and I'm leading the league in rushing for the next decade. I'm going to have the most explosive offense. Now look, let's fast forward. Imagine if Saquon and Lamar had played together, right? What we've seen. And so if Saquon and Jameer Gibbs and B. John Robinson, these are special talents. So they supersede whatever perceived, uh, you know, draft position or positional rankings or positional value because when you hand the ball to Saquon Barkley or Jameer Gibbs or you toss them a little flare route or a screen pass, they have the likelihood to take it 80 yards. That's what you want, right? That's so if you took a receiver that could do the same thing, you know, you everybody be okay, yeah, that's a receiver. But the running back, you can just it's easier to get him the football because you turn around and hand it to him. You don't need pass protection. You don't need the right read. You don't need the right coverage. You just turn around and get that dude the ball. And he's like in a score any given play. That's the one you want to take high. Now, full disclosure, it does work out to where, like, let's say for the Browns, they took Nick Chubb high in the second round. It has worked out for them fully, right? So I'm not saying that you can't find great talent elsewhere, but if you have a chance to take the first round for me, it, I always use the 1989 draft as the the blueprint you have aikman barry sanders Deion sanders Derek thomas that's the first round right elite talents so when you think about first round talent you're thinking the elite of the elite regardless of position and so thinking in that way kind of helps you overcome or oh, take a running back this high or or take you know a, a guard this high you know now you take who you think is an elite talent they say gold jacket worthy but let's just say for the simple all pro worthy. Yeah, you take all pros in round one. I feel like Jameer Gibbs, Saquon Barkley, and whoever the uh, back that's of that caliber can be a potential all pro. You take him. Now, you don't take Tommy Verdell in the first round. 
even though he was a very good fullback uh, at, at, at Stanford. <laughs> but I get what everybody is talking about. But now nah, I'm taking the elite talents early. Shout out to Tommy Verdell, though. <laughs> hey, M, let's turn to uh, let's turn to the Giants 2023 draft class. Just, you know, your your quick thoughts on on Tay Banks, John Michael Schmitz, Jalen Hyatt, the uh, the the sum total of uh, of the Giants 2023 class. I think based off what we saw from their first three picks and what we saw from the back end, you got to give them an A. They got a starter in John Michael Smith. Very good player. He's going to be a Pro Bowl, consistent Pro Bowl player for them. Um, Tay Banks is going to be outstanding. You know, you like that he has the, the brashness at the position. He showed he could play the ball. He's showed he has short memory in case he gets beat. Doesn't bother him. He goes back and gets gets right back after it. We saw Jalen Hyatt get reintroduced to the play, to the uh, to the uh, you know to the game when Tyrod Taylor and Tommy DeVito got into the ball game because they actually threw him the ball, and we saw how easy it is for him to just get deep down the field. So those three guys were were home runs in my opinion. But then you look at the Jordan Riley's valuable minutes he played. You also look at what they got from Trey, uh, Trey Hawkins, valuable minutes he played. And so those five picks help solidify this draft. And we'll still wait and see what we're going to get from Eric Gray and everyone else. Um, but for the most part, I think they they hit home runs. They got impact guys uh, throughout the draft, and that's huge because that's the type of foundational pieces you have to add to build a team. And if they can continue to draft like that, this team will be very much back in the postseason. All right, let's get to brass tacks here. Giants have the sixth overall pick. You're Joe Shane. You're sitting there, and if one of those three quarterbacks falls to six, most likely, you know, might be Drake May. Most likely, if one falls, it would be Jaden Daniels. If one of those three happens to be there, in your mind, is quarterback the obvious choice for the Giants, or can they wait? <sighs> Man, that's a great question. It, yes, it's an obvious choice that they need one, um, but and this is this is and this this is a a great question because it ties into what you believe in terms of scouting. So, still very early. My draft guy comes out late March, but I have done work on the quarterbacks already i've done the position i'm done with that so I, I know where i fall in line with who i like at quarterback um and if you're the giants i, I obviously caleb williams you get the whatever trade up you know for chicago you get to number one you take caleb williams that's that's the given that's the ideal scenario you want um if you if they want to entertain if they want to trade you Justin Fields, that's a great pick based off you having Brian Dayball and what Fields has shown he can do with less. Now you add a stable coaching situation and more. You have the Saquon Barkley effect. You could re-sign him. Um, you know that that works out for you too. Jaden Daniels to me is the Lamar Jackson of the class, while uh, Kate Caleb Williams is the is the Mahomes right. So right. you have in those two, you know, do you obviously Jaden Daniels? If and people need to just disregard the LSU part for a second, go back and watch him at Arizona State as a freshman, and you see someone 18 years old, fresh out of high school, with with you know ice cold water in his veins, playing great situational football, 17 touchdowns, one interception, beating Justin Herbert and the Oregon Ducks, you know in a in a top 10 game right so he has always been this type of guy lsu just enhanced his ability by building that offense around him um so Jaden daniels with brian debo would be the the home run i'm not as high on drake may i feel like drake may is kind of the justin herbert of this class where you watch the games and you just kind of like yeah he's good but this this you feel like there's something missing right and you don't, you can't really pinpoint why it just doesn't pop initially at you. The the wild card, and this is why I'm tying this all into the point I'm about to make. The wild card is Spencer Rattler of South Carolina, 
who was getting first round talk his freshman year at Oklahoma. And then his sophomore year, he gets, you know, he, he had his struggles and get his job taken by Caleb Williams in an impressive fashion. Um, and so the last two years at South Carolina, we saw him on the back end of last year, started to play really well. He locked in, was able to knock down some, some shots, some throws and make some, he looked like the Spencer Rattler that we saw as a freshman in Oklahoma. He could have came out. He said, quote, he wants to go back to school, continue to work with the, with the pro coach that he has. I think it's Jim Bob Cooter and continue to get better. And he did that this year. He played really well. So what we saw last year wasn't a fluke. And I'm saying I'll have to say this. I am going to the senior bowl, you know, next week. So there's a chance that we see Spencer Rattler, who will be there, go clean off in the senior bowl. And now he's in the first round conversation, which if you're the Giants at six, if you can't get Williams or Daniels, do you take a position player and perhaps maybe trade down and then acquire more assets and take someone like Rattler, right? So there's options, but quarterback, they have a wealth of options for them, even if they stay pat at six. If they want to take Williams, if they want to take Daniels or Drake May, or even the wild card Spencer Rattler, the Giants have legitimate options that are better than what they currently have on the roster. So, M, let's move on to another position. Let's move on to offensive line. And we know that the Giants have a mess on the offensive line. 2023 was a bad year for the offensive line. Bobby Johnson got fired. Carmen Brasillo is the new offensive line coach. And I don't want to make this an Evan Neal discussion, but I kind of have a theory with the Giants. Carmen Brasillo comes with the reputation of having done a really good job in Las Vegas working with less. And I kind of have a, a, a theory that what the Giants might do here is bypass Joe Walt, Oli, Olu Fashanu, you know, at the at the top of the class. Because what they did in Buffalo is they built with with day two picks. They built with, you know, middle middle of the road free agents. And I'm I'm wondering if if that's what the Giants might be might be wanting to do here as they rebuild this this offensive line. Um just your thoughts on that. And and if they go that way, you know, maybe your thoughts on on some some day two guys, I think especially on the interior, you know, who might be uh who might be, you know, guys to to keep an eye on. Well, you know, it's a it's a great question. And, and you know. Because when you think about Evan Neal, that's someone that has played across the board in his collegiate career along the offensive line. And Alabama does that where they cross train these guys, right? So you know he has talent. You know he's a talented player. And it's about getting the most out of him. And I will also say this. Yes, he has had his struggles. But we know based off how the Giants, you know, tend to be not giants themselves but fan base and people that watch the giants you know if the quarter instead of blaming the quarterback for a lot of the ills they'll just focus on the offensive line that's like the easiest you know scapegoat we saw that with andrew thomas we've seen it a lot with a lot of players that have uh graced the giants helmet along the offensive line under certain quarterbacks right so i know Evan Neal is not just some chopped liver type player. The question is whether or not do you feel like protecting him either by kicking him inside as a guard or leaving him outside as a tackle and, and working with him uh, even more so to help him you know, have some continuity is going to be the path moving forward. And I think that's the question that they're going to try to figure out. Hey, should we – because that, that'll answer your question about number six, right? The Joe Alta, uh, Fashanu. Um, if if we're gonna go there, then our plan is for Neil to be kicked inside. If not, then we go elsewhere with the pick, and we, like you said, we'll address it in you know maybe round two or three. But bringing in this new coach, I'm pretty sure the talk was, what is Evan Neil? Is he a guard? Is he a tackle? If he's a tackle, 
Where do you see the deficiencies? What needs to be fixed? Can it be fixed? Do we need to go in another direction? Or do you see a path for him maybe inside as a right guard where he can be protected by guys on both sides of him and we can really just get downhill with him because he is so powerful off the ball in the run game? So I think that's where you're going to see the conversation and where the path t- tends to dictate uh, as we approach the draft. Now, full disclosure, I'm still in the process of working through the, the draft process. Like I said, I've graded quarterbacks. I'm halfway done with running backs. I haven't even gotten to offensive linemen yet, so I don't even know names of guys that I've seen, right? It's just like I'm still gathering that information before I dive into the film room. But I will say this. The Giants do have a unique situation where they have talented guys that they have on the roster that have gotten a lot of steps, uh, snaps and starts, unfortunately, due to injury. So your depth is not going to be a concern. It's about nailing the, the five key starters. You got two already in John Michael Smith and Schmidt and also Andrew Thomas. You hope you have a third in Evan Neal. Just where do you think Evan Neal should play moving forward? Yeah, I know that you were high on the two North Carolina kids that Joe Shane drafted in 2022, Josh Azudu and Marcus McKethan. And for a variety of reasons, a lot related to injuries, it hasn't really worked out that well for, for either of those two guys. And I've said this before. I thought coming off a rookie season that he missed where he missed an entire year, didn't even take a snap in a preseason game in 2022 wasn't available to practice until halfway through training camp this time around. Played one preseason game, I think 20 snaps. I thought the Giants were incredibly unfair to Marcus McKethan this past season by, after basically two weeks of practice, asking him to take over as a starting right guard in, in week two of, of the season. My My feeling is, he's probably a better player or could be a better player than he showed. Cause I, I thought that was just, I thought that was asking way too much. And the he, kid admitted to the only other thing I will say is at the end of the season, I talked to him about it and he admitted that his mind was going a thousand miles an hour. He could hear the crowd noise. He could hear everything that was going on. And all of that meant he wasn't, he couldn't focus in on what he was supposed to do because it was too fast for him at that point. Even someone, you know, like Parrot, who had a, a very good start as a rookie in 2020 um, and then fell off the favor, fell off, the, you know, fell out of favor a little bit. It's not that he lacks talent. I, I think a lot of this Giants, you know, offensive line has just to do with continuity injuries and guys having to play in different positions. Man, you can't really get settled, you know, um, and once guys settle in then you can grow. You can build. We saw that with Andrew Thomas. And I'm not saying all of these guys are Andrew Thomas, but I know they have drafted athleticism and talent. And they've looked for that. And they've looked for versatility, guys that can play guard and or tackle. And unfortunately for the Giants, they've had to have played guard or tackle because they're going to end up doing that because they seem to not be able to stay healthy. And I think for them, it's about making sure, I don't know how you can do this, but make sure you guys stay healthy, but continue to add depth. Now, again, you know these guys can play because we've seen them play at times well before. So you know it's in there. It's about can you pull it out of that player and make that be consistent over the course of 17 games? Or or what we're looking at is a guy that's probably going to be a very good uh, swing player for us, whether it's a guard and or a tackle. And that's going to be the questions they have to answer moving forward and into the draft. Okay, do we draft someone that we know can be a starter? while we trust that we have good swing depth. Because like I said before, you know you're going to get A-level play from Thomas and and John Michael Schmidt. It's about figuring out who's the depth guy, who's the starter out of what you already have on the roster, and do we need to go out and grab someone, whether that's at six or on day two. Absolutely. And and I look at it like how many head coaches have the Giants been through since Tom Coughlin? And and you can – Pretty much, you look at the number of head coaches, you can pretty much double the number of offensive line coaches. And that sort of lack of continuity makes it very, very difficult to develop players. Not only develop players, but it makes it very, very difficult 
to fill a roster with the kind of players who fit what you want. So I so it's it, it's no wonder to me that the offensive line you know continues to be a, a sore point. And it's tough when you kind of get uh, as much as they won't say they succumb to media pressure. I'm glad you got a clear clarity moment from from McKeith and saying McKeith and saying like, hey, it, it got to me right. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. you, Andrew Thomas talked about it. Evan yeah. Neal talked about it right uh, in training camp. Um, so it, you know, you, you can't, it is weird. The offensive line, it, it they kind of operate all football players in a way, maybe offensive linemen, maybe receivers, maybe quarterback. They all operate in sense of like kickers where they get into their own head and they can't get out of it. You rarely see that from a defensive lineman. You rarely see that from a running back. Um, you rarely see that from a cornerback cause they, they have all the confidence, um, but it's unique to see it in certain spots on the team where, you know, it's really a mental game more so than a physical one. Absolutely. Hey, last thing for you. The uh, obviously it hasn't been a quiet start to the offseason for the Giants. A lot of a uh, lot of of drama. You know, Brian Dable, Wink Martindale divorce. A lot of chatter on both sides about. Oh, Martindale and the Wilkins brothers did this and Dable did that. And, you know, he's not he's not nice to assistants and he yells at people and he curses at people and all of that. And, and I'm, I'm not asking you to kind of take sides. But w- what I really want to ask you is, you know, you've you've been around long enough. You played the game in college. You've you know, you've you've been around these staffs enough. Is in your mind is is what we're, we've been hearing and, and seeing with the giants is it unusual or is some of this this discord on coaching staffs more prevalent than we might think because these are all guys with with egos they're all alphas they're all guys who if they have this job they want the next job up on the rung so i'm just curious how you feel about about whether this sort of internal discord is more prevalent than than we might think and whether the giants and whether it's 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 cause for alarm with dable that's it yeah that's a great question ed because it is very much common on every staff very much common what is uncommon is that it gets out right you don't normally see lee have certain segments sometimes it's by position sometimes it's by college sometimes it's by you know, where you grew up and, you know, who you relate to, right? But to the outside, they just think that, oh, Daniel Jones could pick up the phone and he'll call, you know, Jack Rabbit, just, just using the example. And, hey, let's go let's go hang out at, at the steakhouse. That doesn't happen all the time, right? So coaches are the same way. You may have a couple of coaches hang out together, a couple of coaches hang out. One coach may be a lone wolf by himself, um, and that's how it is. It's no different than a workplace dynamic. It's work. It just so happens this work is football, it's sports. So we don't tend to look at it like we would look at a corporate office. The difference is, you know, the leaks and it getting out to the media because that right there would be the biggest concern. All right, Em, thank you very, very much for uh, for hopping on. Always appreciate it. I'm sure we'll do it again before the uh, before the draft uh, comes along. Just let people know where they can find your work uh, quickly. Follow me on Twitter at FBall Game Plan. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash football game plan. You can check me on CBS Sports HQ. You'll see me all throughout Super Bowl week on CBS Sports as well. I'll be out there in Vegas, a part of the coverage, so I'm excited about that. And pre-order your draft guide footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. Again, over 1,000 individual scouting reports. It's the industry standard, the best draft guide out there. There you go. It is the the most complete. That's, that's I can't believe you do that many. M. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody got to do it. There you go. All right, Giants fans, thank you as always for listening. Please stay safe out there. Take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.